Hi, thanks for having me. I will be talking about um, Impala, an uh, open source modern SQL engine for Hadoop. Let's see. Does that work? Nope. All right. A little overview. I'll start out with the goals, why we created Impala, and what Impala looks like from the user's perspective. And then I'll um, go over some performance benchmarks that we did internally, and then talk about the Impala architecture and uh, finish with a comparison against existing systems. So Impala was uh, designed to be a general purpose SQL engine uh, running inside of Hadoop, meaning that it's supposed to work for um, a variety of workloads. So not just for ad hoc analytical, but also for transactional or single row workloads. So uh, if you have a storage manager that supports that, meaning you could do single row lookups or um, uh, range scans, uh, you would be able to use that, use Impala against that. You would also be able to use it for a workload that consists of a large number of smaller queries, such as are typical of uh, production environments that do um, use databases, for instance, for web serving. A second goal was to create something that runs directly within Hadoop. So uh, unlike a number of other systems that have come up in the past year or months, uh, this actually runs directly against the widely used for, uh, storage formats, file formats that you find in Hadoop. So it can read those natively, it can talk natively to the popular Hadoop storage managers, and I'll go into a little more detail um, on which those are, and then it also runs on the same nodes that run the Hadoop processes. So you do not need a second cluster in order to um, run Impala inside of your Hadoop environment. A third goal from the, right from the get-go was to have a high-performance system. And to that end, Impala was written in C++ instead of Java, so uh, you don't incur the uh, Java runtime penalties, in particular garbage collection. It uh, utilizes runtime code generation to get rid of uh, execution overheads that you often find in interpretive query engines. And it was written from the ground up. So it does not reuse MapReduce, and it also does not reuse uh, existing open source oh, existing open source SQL engines such as Postgres. From a user's perspective, Impala is a distributed service, meaning you have daemons running in your entire cluster. Um, you talk to it via ODBC and JDBC, and there's also CLI or a, um, a GUI, which is called Hue. And so you can point your uh, BI tools at it, and they interact with it through ODBC or JDBC. When a query comes in, it is distributed and runs on all the nodes in the system that have relevant data. At the moment, Impala is not fault tolerant, meaning that if a query fails, you have to rerun it. It is not automatically um, restarted or pieces of the query are not saved to disk. Um, in order to integrate well with the Hive, uh, sorry, the Hadoop ecosystem, we decided to utilize the um, Hive's metadata storage system, which is called Metastore. So if you're already using Hive in order to map your physical data onto logical relational tables, you will be able to re reutilize that and keep uh, querying those tables in Impala as well. Um, I mentioned before that H Impala supports popular storage formats. In particular, those are a new columnar format called Parquet, and I'll talk a little more about that later. Um, there's also sequence files and RC file with various compression codecs and uh, Avro data files and, of course, uncompressed and LZO compressed text files. Impala is a SQL engine, and the SQL support that you find in Impala is very similar to what Hive supports at the moment. So in essence, it is SQL 92 minus correlated subqueries. That means you have select project join, you have aggregation, there is a union statement, and there is an order by clause, uh, which in this case requires a limit. There is also um, the insert statement. You can run bulk inserts by doing insert uh, select. 
and um, there's also limited DDL support. So you can create tables through Impala, add partitions, alter tables, etc. There are some functional limitations. Um, in particular, right now, there is no support for UDFs, user-defined functions, or um, serialization, deserialization objects, meaning you cannot have uh, file formats be pluggable. Um, Impala right now is also limited to flat relational tables, so there's no support at the moment for arrays, structs, and map-valued columns in the tables. And an operational limitation is that all joins are executed as in-memory hash joins, which means um, in practice that the right-hand side table or the right-hand side input, I should say, of a join is required to fit into the aggregate memory of the machines on which the join is running. Impala supports uh, both HDFS and HBase as underlying storage managers, and uh, what I just described in terms of functionality applies to HDFS in particular. With HBase, uh, the support is a little different because HBase gives you different characteristics than HDFS. In particular, HBase does allow you to do um, single row lookups and short range scans. So. <clears throat> Uh, against HBase tables, you also have support for uh, select statements, bulk insert, but also single row insert or multiple row insert through the value clause. Um, if you map your table, your HBase table, in a particular way into your Metastore table, you can uh, use predicates in the query that are formulated against the column that maps the row key. Uh, those are turned into start and stop rows so that you can actually do single row lookups as well as small range scans um, via Impala against HBase. Uh, if you have predicates on other columns, those are mapped into what the HBase API calls single column value filters. And the goal is to push as much of the uh, filtering down into HBase in order to minimize the amount of data that needs to be retrieved uh, through the HBase API. The mapping that Impala requires right now is patterned after what Hive exposes through Metastore. And in particular, that means that all data needs to be stored as scalars and in ASCII, which is a um, fairly severe functional limitation and a performance limitation. And the row key needs to be mapped to a single string-valued column in the Metastore table. Um, those are things that cause a lot of friction and is not really particularly usable for real-world applications. So I'm just going to uh, uh, describe what is on the roadmap for the HBase integration. This is not supported right now, but we're planning on doing this. In particular, of course, we would like to support update and delete statements. And um, also, you should have the ability to create and declare composite row keys that you can map into an arbitrary number of columns in your Metastore table, in particular columns that are appropriately typed, not necessarily string columns, but that express the, um, the actual type of the data you're mapping. And then, of course, you would like to use uh, structured data instead of simple scalars in your HBase cells in order to minimize the storage and the access overhead. <clears throat> this basically concludes the uh, user view of Impala. And I'll talk a little bit about um, results of benchmarks that we ran internally. So in this case, this is a benchmark uh, based on 20 queries from the TPC-DS, the uh, standard TPC decision support. Um, benchmark <coughs> scaling factor of one terabyte, and we bucketed it into the queries into uh, three categories depending on how much data they access. Uh, if they access something like a month worth of data, we call it interactive. If it's several months, we call it typical of reports. And then something that scans all data, we call deep analytics. Um, this was executed on a cluster of 20 machines, not VMs, physical machines each of which has 24 cores. And uh, you see the, I hope you can see it, the um, Impala and Hive numbers. This is Hive 10, by the way. Hive 11 was not available for evaluation at the time. Uh, 
And you can see that uh, what we label interactive, you can actually run interactively. This is the, the geometric mean of all the queries in that bucket. And this is single user execution. And you end up uh, somewhere in the five to six second range. And you can see that the uh, performance gap to Hive is fairly dramatic. And it uh, keeps on going um, in the other categories along those lines as well. In summary, this is what we've observed, the speed-ups that we've seen. And uh, obviously, really short-running queries are most heavily impacted by Hive's very um, extensive startup overhead and general processing overhead. But even long-running queries, full table scans, etc., show uh, remarkable speed-ups. What I showed you were single-user performance numbers. Here we also did multi-user benchmarks where we ran the same um, queries, the same benchmark queries against the same data set, but now with multiple clients in parallel. You see the graphs here show the response times, again, the geometric means of the response times in the various buckets and how they scale up from 1 to 24 clients. And uh, as you can see, and as you would expect, obviously, as the cluster saturates and you run things with a high degree of concurrency, response times go up. But uh, as you can also see that, for instance, uh, the, what we call the deep analytics is even with 24 clients in parallel, you end up with um, mean response times in the 500 second range. And that compares favorably still uh, against Hive with just a single client. Right, so even a single client, Hive will still run roughly three times as slowly as Impala with 24 clients in parallel. Here's another view of multi-user performance. In this case, we're plotting throughput. Again, uh, multiple clients. And at some point, you can see um, throughput go up. And at some point, you're saturating the cluster, at which point throughput levels off and stays constant. Now, this is actually a good result because that means that the system doesn't waste work. Even as you scale up and do more, more um, have more concurrent users in the system, you, are not, you don't see throughput, total throughput go down. This is, uh, concludes the uh, performance section, and now I'll talk more about the architecture itself. So Impala shows up as two binaries. One is the Impala daemon that I mentioned before that does the actual lifting and query execution and um, handles both client requests and also all internal requests. There's also a thing called the state store, of which there's only one instance and which is used by Impala to provide a name service. Impala itself internally is architected much like a standard MPP database system, so it is typical of what a parallel database system does. Uh, once the request comes in, it is handed off to a planner. The planner then takes this and turns it into a collection of plan fragments, which are then handed off to um, a coordinator that initiates execution on all the remote mo nodes that have relevant data. During execution, those nodes exchange data, in particular they stream intermediate results between them so that you can materialize results as quickly as possible. Meaning there is no intermediate storage into HDFS of intermediate results. Here an example of a running system consisting of a cluster of three nodes, each of which uh, contains runs an HDFS data node and also an HBase region server. And alongside of that is an Impala daemon that contains individual components, the planner, the coordinator, and the executor. And when a query com comes in, the planner produces a plan based on metadata, among other things that it gets from uh, Hive's meta store, as well as the HDFS name node, the data nodes, and the state store. Once the planning is done, it hands it off to the coordinator. The coordinator then initiates execution in parallel to all uh, Impala daemons that sit next to relevant data. And while the query is running, um, the daemons perform the scans and do the data exchange, and results are then streamed back to the user. <clears throat> I'll uh, want to talk a little bit about the um, query planning and what we call actually the front end. Uh, when I said earlier on that Impala is written in C++, that was actually partially a lie. 
the front end, which comprises the um, parser, analyzer, and the plan itself are written in Java. And the reason was that those interact fairly extensively with the rest of the Hadoop ecosystem. In particular, they need to talk to the uh, to Hive's Metastore and the HTTPS name node, etc. And all of that is typically available through a Java client API. So we thought it was easier to do that part in Java. Also, there's no performance relevant, so uh, whatever overhead comes with that is not really, doesn't really impact pre-execution. Finally, it's done as a two-phase process. Um, the first phase produces a single node plan, which is the typical left deep tree of plan operators. If you've ever used MySQL or Oracle and run an explain plan, you will see basically the output of that is similar to what comes out of this one. The second phase is the partitioning phase, which takes the single node and breaks it up into plan fragments for parallel execution. The goal of this uh, parallelization is, or the partitioning is, uh, of course, the full parallelization of all query operators. Um. Um, currently, uh, the Impala planner does not do join order optimization, so uh, whatever you specify in the from clause is the order in which the joins are being executed. We're planning on changing that in the future and adding a cost-based optimizer. Here's an example of a query that does three joins. It joins two large tables that are HDFS resident with one small table that is HBase resident. Applies some predicates and then does a grouping followed by an order by with a limit clause. And um, here is the plan that would come out of that. Right? You see the two join operators in the middle fed by scans um, followed by an aggregation, followed by a top N operator. <clears throat> the second phase does the uh, partitioning of the single node plan into multiple plan fragments. And so the overall goals are to maximize scan locality. You really want to read all data and locally and process all data locally as much as possible in order to minimize data movement and data, um, basically, network transmission overhead. Another goal is, of course, to fully distribute all query operators. So in particular, you want to parallelize joins. Joins are parallelized either as uh, broadcast joins, in which case the right-hand side input of the join is, is broadcast to all um, nodes that take part in any of the join processing. Or it is done as a partition join in which both tables are partitioned on the join columns. And so that uh, the right-hand side input is then partitioned among all of the nodes that do the right hand uh, that do the join processing. The decision between uh, whether it does the joins in one mode or the other is based on the estimated cost of the data movement. And to that end, Impala uses the column statistics that have been added to Hive relatively recently. It basically uses those to estimate the uh, total cost of the data transfer. Aggregation is also parallelized into a pre-aggregation step that is done at the point where the data is first materialized, followed by a merge aggregation step that is also distributed um, by repartitioning the output of the first aggregation step on the grouping columns. The top N operator is also distributed uh, by initially doing the top N again at the point where the data is first materialized followed by a single uh, final top end operation in a single plan fragment. So in the example, uh, going back to this example, this contained the first join did uh, a join between two large tables. The second one joined the input with a small table, and then it contains an aggregation in top n. And this is parallelized and partitioned into these six plan fragments. So you can see, first of all, that all of the scans are done in their own separate plan fragment in order to maximize scan locality. The first join is between two large tables, so a, a partition join is more appropriate. 
and the outputs of the scans are repartitioned on the join columns, which in this case are IDs. The second join is between um, is to a small table on the right hand side. This one is done as a broadcast join, so that the output of the HBase scan is then broadcast um, to those join operators. In the same node, uh, the output of the second join is then used for the pre-aggregation step, which then is repartitioned on the grouping column and um, the merge aggregation is done in a separate plan fragment, followed by the initial phase of the top N, which is then followed by the um, final phase, which is the final top N, which also then sends back the results to the client. I mentioned uh, metadata handling before, and so metadata comes in from a variety of sources. One is, of course, Hive's Metastore, and uh, which contains all the logical metadata, such as table definitions, columns, about uh, things about users, etc. Create table parameters. There's, of course, also the HDFS name node, which contains the metadata about the physical data. Um, for a particular directory, it can tell you which files exist, and it can tell you the uh, block replicas of the uh, blocks that make up the files. The uh, data nodes themselves contain, also contain interesting metadata, namely the uh, volume IDs of the individual blocks, which we use for improved uh, I.O. scheduling. Unlike Hive, Impala caches metadata. Um, we did not want Hive, uh, basically does synchronous metadata API calls, meta store API calls, whenever a query runs, and of course that adds a lot of overhead if you want to run things at sub-second sub -second latency, so we decided not to do that in Impala and instead cache all the metadata, which means uh, you also need a cache invalidation mechanism. This right now is done directly and uh, through a command, the refresh command. We are planning on changing that so that metadata is distributed through the state store component and uh, which then would then also be uh, responsible for propagating updates to the metadata. Now there's also Edge Catalog, which uh, was not available at the time that Impala was first started, so we're planning, also planning on supporting um, that standard. The Impala execution engine itself is written in C++, as mentioned before, and an explicit goal was to design it for minimal execution overhead. So to that extent, it is using a, an optimized in-memory format that in particular puts uh, fixed with data at fixed offsets, so that if you have operations on that data, such as adding two integer columns, you would actually be able to compile that into a single addition into a single add instruction without having to do any pointer resolution. Impala also makes extensive use of uh, intrinsics and special CPU instructions, of which the uh, most recent or even uh, looking a few years back, newer processor models have quite a few. In particular, SSE instructions uh, are useful for text parsing or things like hash value computation, as for instance the CRC32 instruction. Um, a big part of the performance story of Impala is runtime code generation. And uh, this happens at the level of the big loops that you normally find in a typical SQL execution engine. So uh, when you look at the operator tree produced by the planner, each of these operators typically operates on a batch of rows. And it loops over that batch and performs a single operation or a, a number of operations repeatedly. And uh, you know, almost all the processing is done in those big loops. And uh, so the way it's done typically in something like Postgres, which uses uh, an interpretive approach, incurs a lot of interpretive overhead, which uh, in the form of function calls, but also something like switches on the data types itself. And all of those things conspire basically to, um, to obliterate the performance of a modern CPU, a modern pipeline CPU, where a lot of the performance is gained through instruction level parallelism. So to that end, Impala uses a tool called LLVM, which is an open source toolkit, basically a compiler toolkit, to do runtime code generation 
and generate these big loops in a form that gets rid of all unnecessary branches and all function uh, calls. You basically end up with something that is fully inlined and minimizes dead code and branches. I mentioned the state store before. Uh, Impala uses that. It's a central component. Impala uses it as a name service right now. So all, uh, all Impala demons in a running cluster know about each other by uh, propagating their membership information through the state store. The goal is to use the state store as a general purpose distribution mechanism for all interesting cluster state, such as metadata or anything that is scheduling relevant. Um, the state store itself is soft state, meaning that it is not the final store of record for any of the data that is flying around the system. So if it goes away, all the data is replicated at all the Impala demons. If the state store goes away, the cluster will keep running and functioning because all the data is replicated. And uh, if you bring the state store back up, it reinitializes itself from, um, by re-registering with the running Impala demons or having the Impala demons re-register with itself. It is scalable by uh, relying on pushing data and using heartbeats to the Impala demons so that it does not get overwhelmed uh, in a large cluster by the Impala demons hitting the state store itself synchronously. Uh, we often get a question of why not use Zookeeper for this purpose. We actually looked at Zookeeper and uh, it turned out that Zookeeper is not particularly good at what we really cared about, which was the pub sub component. In particular, we looked at the communication patterns and it turned out that it would have required end by end communication in our case, which uh, would have been prohibitive in very large clusters. At the same time, Zookeeper does a number of things that we don't care about, such as uh, serialization and persistence, so we ended up deciding that Zookeeper would add more overhead and um, be more of a liability and require more management than uh, if we simply added a very simple and uh, lightweight component such as the state store. This concludes the architecture part and now I want to talk about uh, competing systems. So one is, of course, Dremel. Dremel has become a very popular and talked about since the initial publication in 2010. And if you take a step back, what is Dremel? Dremel uh, really um, contributed a columnar storage format for data with a nested structure. So inside of Google, everything is stored in, uh, initially in protocol buffers, and protocol buffers naturally let you expose and express a nested structure. So the, there was a need to come up with a fully shredded format for, a, for nested structures, which was accomplished with the column I.O. format. And Dremel also basically uses uh, distributed scalable aggregation algorithms on top of that columnar structure in order to get uh, highly scalable query execution. Those were, to a large extent, actually borrowed from the existing um, techniques that have been invented for parallel databases. So what are the equivalents in the Hadoop ecosystem? Um, there was, at the time when we talked about this, there was no particularly usable columnar format. So uh, we created Parquet, and when I say we, this is actually a collaboration between Twitter and Cloudera. So there's a new columnar format called Parquet, which I'll talk about in the next slide in a little more detail. And then, of course, Impala, which runs on Parquet as well as other file formats, gives you the distributed aggregation piece. So the two of them together are actually a superset of what Dremel provided as of the 2010 publication. I'm not talking about the most recent versions of Dremel. So a little more about Parquet. Uh, what is it? It is a columnar format that is a container format, designed as a container format that is suitable for all serialization formats. So it is not tied to any, anything like Avro, Thrift, or protocol buffers. It can be used for all of those. It is the successor to uh, Trevny, which Doug Cutting worked on. And as I mentioned before, it was co-designed by Cloudera and Twitter. So uh, Twitter also expressed interest in this, so it ended up, we ended up collaborating on this. And it is open source and hosted on GitHub right now. And um, there are actually a, uh, there's a third company working on this. So the goal is to have Parquet support, native Parquet support across all four uh, frameworks uh, 
in Hadoop. So in particular, it'll be natively supported for Pig, MapReduce, uh, Hive. So Pig and MapReduce is being done by Twitter. Hive, there is a company in Paris called Critio working on the Hive 30. And of course, Cloudera is working on the Impala integration. And uh, Twitter is also interested in a cascading integration. In terms of features, it is a fully shredded format, and in particular, it uses the uh, notion of repetition and definition levels s similar to basically the same as Dremel's column I.O. in order to capture the nesting structure of um, your nested relational data. Column values are stored in their native types, so unlike RC file, which stores everything, integers, and even as ASCII, this stores everything in their native types, and also has uh, support for extensible value encodings, so there is run length encoding, there is dictionary encoding, etc., and also support for index pages for fast lookups. If you look at uh, Hive in particular, how is Hive different from Impala? Obviously, Hive is based on MapReduce and uh, very similar to Google's Tenzing project, Hive breaks down a SQL query into a number of MapReduce jobs, which comes uh, with a host of features, the most notable of which is uh, fault tolerance. Obviously, MapReduce gives Hive instantaneous fault tolerance, but it also comes with a high price, namely the high latency and low throughput that you normally get from using MapReduce by having to store things, write things, and read things back out from HDFS repeatedly. Hive also includes a, um, a very extensible architecture, uh, and it has a, an almost excessive layering architecture inside, which means that you can extend it through UDFs and SERDIs, but it also means that it comes with extremely high processing overhead itself. Impala, in comparison, is, uh, obviously does direct data exchange, doesn't contain fault tolerance at the moment, and has an execution engine that was initially designed for low runtime overhead, so it cuts out as much processing overhead and layering as possible. In particular, it doesn't do any function calls inside uh, the main processing itself. So very shallow stacks. N what I talked about so far was uh, what Impala is right now. There obviously the question is, what are we going to do in the future? Um, one of the, there's obviously additional SQL that Impala doesn't support that is desirable, and one of the most requested features is support for UDFs. So that is definitely something on the roadmap. Uh, there's also SQL authorization and more DDL. So uh, beyond additional alter table statements, as well as grant and revoke statements and SQL style um, table and column level permissions that users of relational databases expect from something that looks like a relational database system. There's also uh, the desire to have an order by clause without a limit and analytic and window functions, of course. So uh, basically the, um, the rolling window functions that are part of SQL 2003. Another thing that is also interesting for a lot of users is support for structured data types, so having maps, arrays, and uh, structs inside of, inside of, um, inside of individual columns. I already mentioned improved HBase support, and uh, there are also a number of runtime optimizations that we're going to be working on, uh, such as straggler handling, join order optimization. I mentioned that before. Obviously, you want that to be cost-based, and also improved cache management. Right now, uh, when you're running out of memory, you are actually utilizing the OS buffer cache, and running out of the OS buffer cache comes with a number of overheads that are um, that you would like to cut out compared to what a relational database system does, which contains its own buffer cache and where a, basically a page read, quote unquote, out of memory is nothing but basically a pointer transfer. Um, obviously, you can't quite get that by reading out of the OS buffer cache, so there's, there are things to be improved. There's also the, the desire to do data co-location for improved joint performance. This is also a typical technique of parallel database system where you partition your data and, in particular, co-partition tables that are joined typically on the join columns and uh, so that all joins are transferred into local joins. <clears throat> 
I mentioned better metadata handling, in particular distribution through the state store, and there's also the goal to have better resource management, in particular to be able to run exploratory and production workloads in the same cluster without the exploratory workloads being able to steal resources and um, impact the production workloads. This basically concludes the talk. Um, Impala 1.0 has just been released about five weeks ago. Uh, it is available in for several prepackaged for several operating system distros. You probably run one of them. And uh, Impala is also Impala's open source and hosted on GitHub. And um, there is a user list that is actively monitored by the Impala team. So if you're running it and have questions, uh, you should address them to the Impala user list. This concuns my talk. All right, if you yes, have any questions.